great British sports car. A little cheeky. It was about as much fun as you could have in those days with your trousers on. Tantalizingly fast. I remember the first time we went at 100 miles an hour down the A5. But above all, thrilling. Shooting up the M1 in my dad's friend's E-Type, clinging on and seeing the big gauge at 135 miles an hour, thinking, this is the most exciting thing I'm ever going to do in my life, and if I die now, so be it. This is the story of how the mass-produced British sports car democratised speed and glamour. It was a very glamorous era. And they were beautiful cars. How, in a lost decade of 50s hedonism, they perked up a grey country and sparked a manufacturing frenzy. We could not make sports cars fast enough. Our trousers were on fire. A world of Healy 100s, frog-eyed sprites, Jaguar E-types. This was the golden age of the British sports car. Strangely enough, the story of our mass-produced British sports cars starts with these guys. Well, not these actual men, but American GIs. We didn't always appreciate them, but after the war, the cash-strapped motor industry needed their money. Amongst all the boring family saloons Britain made, there was one car which really tickled the GI's fancy. What really focused the British attention on the sports car was that American servicemen who'd been stationed over here, uh, they'd been stationed in the US Air Force bases in East Anglia and so on, they had seen these charming little MG sports cars running around, which were to be made before the war, and they thought they were fun. And quite a lot of them bought these little MGs and took them back to America. And suddenly, quite unexpectedly, and with no effort at marketing or promotion, the British motor industry found that the British sports car, specifically the little MG midget, was a potential dollar earner for export. That's right, GIs had spotted MG's two-seater sports car. But MG didn't have any new cars to sell. Like everyone else, they'd spent the last five years servicing the war effort, making parts for aircraft and overhauling tanks. Anything except building sports cars. They quickly scrambled into action. Hoping no one would really mind in the circumstances, they dusted off the pre-war design that the Americans loved, added a tweak here and there, and the car was ready. It was called the MGT Midget. Oh, bless. This was the sports car that started it all. It took America by storm. And it still has lots of pre-war hangovers with cycle mudguards and big-spoked wheels. But it has a lovely, snorty little engine. And you're sitting there like a racing driver, like Nuvolari, with your arm, you know, spilling over the door and a big, big steering wheel with a horn push st pointing straight at your heart. And it's great. And you just look cute. Overnight, the idea of a mass-produced British sports car had been invented. With the old upgrade and occasional facelift, the MGT series went on to sell nearly 50,000 cars, most of them in America, but there was a home market too. As matters improved and the world got slightly more peaceful, um, people were able to indulge themselves, and uh, obviously one of the great indulgences is a pointless sports car that's got two seats and a great big engine and is only good for one thing, and that's a hell of a lot of bloody fun. The dream didn't come cheap for the Brits. In 1947, the average salary was £416. A new MGT cost £527, which, in case you're wondering, is about £17,000 in today's money. 
but unlike a custom-built Ferrari, these British sports cars were within reach of affluent professionals. Perhaps a suave doctor or a rakish bank manager. Early 1950s Britain offered driving nirvana for these lucky few. With a tenth the number of vehicles around, it was easy to put your foot down through the twisty roads. They were just slightly rakish, perhaps, I don't know. But, uh, of course, they were you drive around with the hood down. And this car was right, quite interesting because it got the optional extra aero screens fitted behind the main windscreen. So you could lower the windscreen and you'd got the aero screens, like the racing cars. It was every young man's dream of a sports car to have like the MGTC and I'd been a very lucky young man because uh, I, ordinarily I wouldn't have been able to afford it but I believe it or not in 1952 I inherited 2,600 pounds which was a lot of money those days so it's not bad now uh, and of course um, shock horror I uh, suddenly got the wherewithal to buy this, one of these much sought after cars by young men with an eye on what his parents might think, John, rather than throw all his money away, went for a second-hand MG. It was £425, as I recall, which was quite a substantial sum. And I caught the, the bus with a wad of notes all the way into, from West Bromwich to Birmingham. And I bought the car there and then for cash uh, and uh, drove it home. Oh, my parents, what have you done? <laughs> all this money. But nonetheless, we loved it. Well, it was quite glamorous, really, and yeah. I came from a background where my mother and father hadn't got a car, and I think it was probably one of the first cars I'd ever been in. And it was, well, glamorous, I suppose, wasn't it? Well, it felt yeah. as though you were getting somewhere in life from the sort of background yeah. we'd both come yes, from. Yes, yes, quite modest. A new MG was out of reach to most of the middle classes, and it was kept deliberately expensive. To encourage exports to America, the government added on the dreaded purchase tax, which made an already pricey sports car even pricier. There was purchase tax on anything, like a radio set or a car or a, or a whatever. Uh, and the rating of that tax was, was raised or lowered, depending on how they wanted the demand to go. At one time, I can tell you... Um, there was a limit of £1,000, I believe, for car prices. Below that, the purchase tax on a car that cost £1,000 was at 33%. Above it was 66%. Even in these hard times, there was a feeling of optimism in the air. For those few with the money, finding some fun amongst all the austerity was a must, even if it meant taking the extra tax on the chin. You've got to say... Consumers having to pay that amount of money, they wanted these cars really badly then, didn't they? They would pay any price for these lovely, new, exciting, fast cars, and if it meant paying 50% of the government for the privilege to drive them, then so be it. But hold on. The MGT was about to get blown out of the water as another famous brand muscled in on the act. In 1948, Jaguar unveiled their XK120 to a swooning audience and instantly made the MG look a bit prehistoric. Clark Gable is pictured getting out of one and suddenly the world just stands back and sighs with admiration. It was the poster boy of the mass-produced sports car. Our rich cousins over the pond could just afford one, but in post-war Britain there was fat chance. The XK120 cost £1,263, weighing in at an eye-watering 36000 in contemporary money. It had 120 miles an hour top speed and film star looks, but was more than twice the cost of an MGT. Even our rakish bank manager would balk at that. Whoever could combine the beauty of the XK120 with the driving thrill of the MG at a lower price would take the British sports car into the modern age. Step up Leonard Lord, autocrat of the Austin Motor Company. He too wanted to cash in on America's love affair with a sports car. 
Lord had plans for Austin. Austin were then making fairly puddingy, um, soggy, middle-of-the-road saloon cars, which were driven by bank managers or whatever they might be uh, of the day, tax inspectors perhaps. Uh, they were all called after British counties. So there was the Austin A70 Hampshire, the Austin A40 Devon, which was succeeded by the A40 Somerset. And they had all this running gear, which was basically the sort of things that you put under a soggy saloon. And they decided to put that soggy saloon running gear under what they thought was a car that was as sexy and svelte and exciting as the latest Cadillac. They were trying to produce a miniature American car. The car that Lord announced to great fanfare was the Austin A90 Atlantic. An Americanized sports car. In their effort to capture a share of export markets, British car manufacturers leave nothing to chance. And on continental roads, new models that have never been seen by the general public in England are here shown undergoing practical tests before the production line gets moving in earnest. It was an unmitigated disaster. It cost quite a lot of money to make. and By the time they'd got it to America, the Americans are very good, and were then, at mass-producing big comfortable cars for very little money. And so by the time the Austin Atlantic got to America, it, was, it had less room in it than an American car. It went slower than an American car because with all these bits of chrome on it, it was quite heavy for the Austin A70 Hampshire engine. And it was quite expensive. So it had no appeal to the Americans whatever. A few were sold as a curiosity. It had gadgets on it, but gadgets made by Brits. So, you know, you'd have like an electric roof, press a button and very, very slowly the hood would come up. You know, if it, if it actually made it over the whole car, you'd be glad. But usually what would happen is the electric motor would burn out, you know. So it was a kind of disaster. It was a very misguided attempt to, you know, sell them something that we, we thought they wanted instead of something that they actually wanted. Poor old Leonard Lord was left looking pretty sheepish. The Atlantic had missed the point completely. A sporty car was supposed to be fun to drive. The Americans had enough slow and flabby cars of their own. They wanted the British approach that Jaguar and MG did so well. The Atlantic also failed on the style stakes. It was as ugly as old sin. Style now mattered. Even in Britain, the nation's attention had been focused on modern design at exhibitions such as Britain Can Make It and the Festival of Britain. The space age styling of the 50s was a celebration of progress. It looked to the future. The public wanted their sports cars to do the same. Only a car that offered futuristic looks, a hundred miles an hour performance and the promise of pleasure would do. In 1952, out of the ashes of Leonard Lord's Atlantic failure, came a sports car that would be a runaway success. Working out of an old RAF hangar, a tiny car maker called Healy had some big ideas. At the helm was Donald Healy, and he wanted to create sports car alchemy. Way back in the 1930s, Donald Healy had won the Monte Carlo Rally. In the 1930s, he had been technical director of Triumph when it was still an independent company. But during and after the war, he set out to make his own cars in his own company, which he did for some years at a scruffy little factory in Warwick. And it was only in the early 50s he took a deep breath and thought, OK, he could see the potential of sending cars to the United States. Healy had heard about Austin's American misadventure with the A90 Atlantic. He knew that Leonard Lord had piles of leftover Atlantic parts stacked up in his factories and was desperate to find a use for them. Donald Healy had a bold vision. He would take the best bits of the failed Atlantic and use them to make a real sports car for the 1952 Motor Show. 
Using their racing expertise, his small band of engineers teased a hundred miles per hour performance out of the engine and created a car that drove like a dream. But Donald Healy wasn't satisfied. He hated the look of the car's front end with its oversized grille. With no time to change it before the motor show, he ordered it to be displayed with its nose hidden behind a large pillar. That didn't stop Leonard Lord from spotting it. Leonard Lord went to the opening day of the motor show, peered behind the pillar, saw the Healy 100 using his engine, thought it was brilliant, and said to Donald Healy, I will make this car for you. In an amazing turn of fortune, Lord agreed on the spot to mass produce Healy's car. In return, it would be renamed the Austin Healy 100. Hello. This was the sports car that set the standard for a new generation. Wonderful, marvelous, you should care for me. It really took Donald Healy to, you know, bring it all together and add a bit of sex appeal and also come up with something that he knew everyone would want and that would be a car that would do 100 miles an hour. In those days, that was a kind of magic figure and I think he thought that, you know, if he could produce a car that could do that and demonstrate it to people, then he would have an export winner on his hands. It looked beautiful, it did 110 miles an hour, the Americans loved it. It immediately started to sell. Contrary to Donald Healy's fears, the 100 styling was the very thing that people fell in love with. What really matters to the ordinary man in the street lusting after a new toy is what it looks like. If you actually look at the construction of the Healy, it wasn't that different from the, M the later types of MG Midget, the TD and the TF, which were then being made. But of course it looked like a modern car. It had a full width, all enveloping body, whereas the MG Midget still had separate mud guards. Even for a die-hard MG fan, it was too much to resist. There's not a straight line on it. It's curved in every dimension, from above, from the side, from the back, the front. Even the windscreen is a one-piece curved screen, which was unheard of. It just looked so... Not necessarily... I don't know how to explain it. It just looked so... You used to say it's like a beautiful woman. It is. It is. You can stroke her curves. There was only one thing John could do to satisfy his longing. Head straight off to the dealer. This, this is the dream car, really. This is this is the what. It looked so nice. It was new and smooth, and mm. and um, I because you know, the, the the catalog list price was a thousand and sixty three twelve shillings and sixpence. <laughs> that was the that was the catalog price. They could see that I was mm, oh, this car, this car. I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, and they struck a deal with me, and I've got the receipt for it. Still got the receipt. The British sports car was no longer just a fun way to get around. The Healy projected just the right image for the aspirational middle class. Yes, it, it was just glamorous, wasn't it? It was, it yes. Really oh, yes. Was. Yeah. It certainly <laughs> felt in a cut above, shall we say. Like I said, you didn't get somewhere, you arrived. Yes. I suppose, yes. looking yeah. back, you were treated a bit differently, weren't you, when you arrived in a car like Oh, that? yes. Yes, there, yes, there was a... Yes, um... A bit like arriving in a Rolls well, Royce now, I guess. People thought, mistakenly, that we were people of substance. Little did they know. <laughs> the Healy had cost John the equivalent of nearly £21,000. It would require a few... compromises. We got married in June 1956, and we went on our honeymoon in the in the Healy. And actually, I lost my cap; it blew off because we got the hood down. We came home to a house we'd just bought with the rest of, well, the, uh, uh, of the well, money, and we got this lovely car in the garage and no furniture in the house. 
<laughs> the Austin Healy had all the right ingredients. Now other manufacturers knew what to aim for. The sports car scene was about to explode. By 1955, Standard Triumph had got in on the act with its manly and rugged TR series. A cheeky looking 100 miles an hour car that cost less than the Healy. It was noisy but great fun, so I said, yeah, I'll have one of those. And it turned up in about five or six weeks. So it was black with blue interior and it had a heater. Uh, in fact, the first, when building a TR2, the first thing they put there was a heater and then built everything else around it. So if you needed to repair the heater at all, uh, you had to take the car apart, more or less. It was ridiculous. But it, uh, in, it was a 100 mile an hour car, and there was no speed limits then, apart from the 30 mile an hour in towns. And so you could bat along at whatever speed you like. MG also rejoined the sports car world with the MGA, their first new car since the war. With sweet modern looks, it was one of Elvis's favorites. That's to say, quite girly. The golden age of the British sports car had arrived. By the mid-50s, let's say, sort of 1955, where the MGA was launched, that you then had three quite accomplished and exciting and desirable British sports cars in the, the mid-range. You'd start with the MG, which was suddenly a very good-looking car. You'd have the TR above it. Then you'd have the Healy 100 for above that. So there was, you know, suddenly there was quite a good choice. And they're all really good-looking vehicles. They've all got this ability to lean your arm out. You know, very important that, you know, when you see your flat cap, that you've got your arm dangling out of the side of the car. You know, the leather patch of your blazer visible. Very important indeed. And they all facilitated that. Once MG launched the MGA, we had three basic motor cars to argue about in the pub. There's always been a love-hate relationship between Triumph and MG. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Moses said unto the Lord, come forth, but he could only come fifth because he was driving an MGB. And Healy drivers had it in for Triumphs. The TR2, the styling was ghastly compared... <laughs> <laughs> you might be seeing some nice gentleman with a TR2. Yeah. And you know, that was actually, it had got a tractor engine in it. <laughs> actually, the engine wasn't bad. The engine wasn't bad. It was the best part of the car. It was cheaply made, really, uh, and it just, it just didn't look right. I didn't like the Healy because it has this leaning back look to it. I, I fancy that, really. It doesn't bother some people. But I didn't like that. People became Triumph men, or people became MG men, or whatever. And to, to, to see or hear of people jumping ship from one model to another, from one brand to another, it, there weren't many of them about. And this is, this is what the, all the advertising people played on, that once they got their claws into people, they made jolly sure that they could uh, keep them. To keep their customers' fanatical loyalty going strong, the manufacturers all tried to hog the publicity limelight. Each brand wanted to look the fastest, the coolest, and the most contemporary out there. It was time to pull out the big guns. And what better way to show your thrusting modernity than by becoming a record breaker? MG and Austin Healy would both go over for two or three weeks to the salt flats in Utah in the States to do long distance events, you know, three hours round and round in a circle, 24 hours and so on. They'd take a specially streamlined one over to Utah and they'd, they'd, they'd try and set all kinds of, you know, speed records for the engine size. So it wasn't that they were trying to produce the fastest car on earth, but they'd be producing the fastest car 
up to 1500 cc, you know, whatever that was, 0.7 miles an hour, would then be something they could use in all their advertising and, you know, sort of really crow about it. Abingdon, on the River Thames, the MG car factory. From these drawing boards over the years have come one model after another of a world famous family of sports cars. Right now, the draftsmen are working on a very special job, that of designing the fastest one and a half litre car in the world. A car tailor made to fit one of the fastest drivers in the world, Sterling Moss. The MG car company decided they wanted to go for this world record, Class G, I think it is. And of course, they had this fantastic looking car. I mean, it was about the height of my knee and beautiful street. I'd lie backwards like this and the steering wheel was like that. Moss climbs into the driving seat to see how it feels. Everything must be perfect. For a fault that would only be a minor discomfort at a mile a minute could be disastrous at four miles a minute. The point about that, of course, being that the, the, almost the whole motor car was special, but it did have the basics of a standard MG engine and things like it. And most important, it had the big MG badge up front, and that's really all that mattered. Sterling, typical Sterling, I admire the man for so much. Sterling apparently would arrive the day before these events, would look at the car and say, is this it? All right, jump in. And with, within one, two or three runs, he would set the record and then fly home. He was such a pro. Sterling Moss is ready. Record breaking's a new departure for him, except, of course, Grand Prix lap records, which he breaks with almost monotonous regularity. I remember taking top gear at about 200, which is really, really interesting. You don't really steer it, you sort of wish it goes that way, a little bit this way. That was a bit um, scary. Speed records squeezed out of custom-made death traps were perfect to make the brand look heroic. But the thing that really sold a sports car was the dream that you too could imitate your hero on the racetrack. Prestigious races like Le Mans were the ideal place for manufacturers to show off their cars and gain precious publicity. I can't stress too much how important success in motorsport was to the image of the British sports car, particularly in the 50s and 60s. Not only did uh, each of the manufacturers have a works team, a factory-backed team, they would pick and choose their events carefully so that somehow or other they hoped they could always gain success, even if they weren't going to win outright. So it meant, for instance, that Triumph would go to Le Mans, even though they were only going to finish 9th, 10th or 11th and Ferrari would win, they could still have something to advertise at the end of it. Right from the start, the Giants battled for the lead, whilst the Triumph settled down to lap steadily according to their prearranged plan. The phrase, we've all heard the phrase, win on Sunday, sell on Monday, effectively that's an American invention, the phrase, but it applied. So, if MG had uh, done something wonderful on a Sunday, you would be amazed how often an advert would appear in the Daily Express the day after, or in Autosport the week after, making sure that the world knew about this. They were all fighting for the same market, they were all fighting for the same people. And if, if as an example, MG could say, we went to Le Mans and we won the class in the 24-hour race, and the opposition weren't able to say it, tick, that's a, that's a plus point. But while Le Mans races used customised versions of everyday sports cars, 1950s rallying offered the chance to see them compete straight out of the showroom. The cars racing in the thrilling European events were the very models that you could buy from the dealers down the road. This was publicity gold. Still leading the way and unpenalised with their TR3. We were running, in those days, standard cars. I was lucky enough to sit with the guy who won the first British Rally Championship in 1958. He used his own TR3. On one event, before one event, he got some problems with it. We borrowed a sales demonstrator from the Triumph dealer in Stoke-on-Trent. The only tuning he did, he checked the tyre pressures. I put a bit of cardboard on the dashboard so that my map light wouldn't reflect in the screen. That was the only work we did. And on the Monday morning, I took it back to the dealers. It went into the sales suite. If the winds weren't coming in, 
the manufacturers had another trick up their sleeves. By the way, the age of chivalry is not dead. The ladies must not receive male assistance from their teammates. Yes, women came to the rescue. All women teams raced the same events as the men, but battled for the ladies' prize, the award for the highest placed women. Having far less competition meant a much better chance of bringing in some silverware. They could pop their little win in the papers and get some kudos for the manufacturer. At the Earl's Court Motor Show less than four months later, the hardtop MG, as used on the Alpine Rally, made its first public appearance on the stand. Having proved its worth in the rigorous test of international competition of the highest order, the car becomes available to the discerning motorist. Graceful of line, small and pretty, and at the same Oh, for goodness sake. Winning women's prizes was all very well, but Austin Healy got the best press ever when they recruited a woman who could beat the men hands down. Her name was Pat Moss. We never thought of ourselves as women as a woman's crew. We just thought of ourselves as rallyists, and Pat was one of the very best. My sister wasn't really interested in being the fastest lady. They wanted to win outright, and she was, she was of that, of that mould. Pat Moss owned her own Triumph TR2, a car she nicknamed Fruity, after the sound of the exhaust. But she needed sponsorship to compete in rallying. She approached triumphs to say I would like to do this major rally could you support me and they offered to lend her a car but no money and she said well I've got the car it's the money I haven't got the budget so triumph lost Pat Moss. In the PR game triumph had royally dropped the ball they'd lost the Moss name a female driver and a winner. Pat would prove to be publicity dynamite. I think they thought she was just another lady driver. And she turned out to be a lot better than that. Paired up with a new generation of Austin Healy, they were about to take the rally world by storm. When we first started with the Healy, I think it was a tulip rally, and they were real pigs to drive. With the press watching, they entered the hardest rally in the world, the Liège-Rome-Liège. Not for them the ladies' prize, they were going all out to win the whole event. It was a tall order, given the demands of the race. Four days, four nights, one hour break, not per day, one hour for the four days. Dust, carts without any lights on in the old Yugoslavia. But you see, I'm getting excited talking about it now. It was absurd, but marvellous. Forget about speed records and Ponce French races. If anything could sell the raw thrill of the sports car, this rugged rally was it. And there was a woman at the wheel. We came out of Yugoslavia covered in dust and dirt and uh, washed at a fountain in the first place in uh, Italy that we came to. And then we had to get on with it on the long, long drive back to Liège. She was so tired and she saw the, the uh, telegraph poles she thought were men walking across the road. And I saw flaming cars in front of us and told her to dodge them. And, uh, and we were desperate, desperate, but we made it. Pat and Anne didn't just make it. They'd beaten all the best men in the world. Never mind, chaps. There are a lot of people, and I'm one of them, who feel that Pat's win on the Liège in Austin Hill 3000 with Anne was one of the greatest motorsport events, certainly one of the greatest wins of all time. If anything was going to sell sports cars, this was it. The atmosphere around a win was electric, and for Pat and Anne, victories meant glamming it up for the cameras. Almost as much fun as winning the race. Especially with the Healy's, it was a very glamorous era. We, we were very proud to be part of it, and they were beautiful cars. There was always a team of three or four of them in the rallies, and we always, at the end of a rally, they always expected the girls to dress up um, and have our hair done and be as glamorous as we could. And there were lots of 
photos taken with these beautiful cars and um, and it was great fun. It was a glamorous time. Monte Carlo is a glamorous place. Part of the appeal of all the motorsport publicity was Europe. The continent represented glamour and the era's idea of the exotic. And by the end of the decade, thanks to rising disposable income, it was within reach of the middle classes. Those who could afford a sports car could now afford to emulate their icons and go for a jaunt through Europe. I remember the first time when we first used to go on the continent in the car. We used to drive down the A5 and round Marble Arch. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of doing that now. It was a lot of fun. It was, it? yes. The continental wind blowing in your hair. <laughs> it was really good. For a British sports car, the sweeping roads and mountain passes were a natural habitat. Oh, there's always one. Finally, you could drop that top and not risk a soggy bottom. If you have a top down, uh, not friendly on the hair, do you? Well, we went all the way to Spain in the 3A with a top down. My wife uh, reluctantly accepted this diktat and put a scarf around her hair and got on with it. <laughs> the British sports car was becoming the height of cool. From Monte Carlo to the streets of Rome, everyone wanted to be seen in one. And they were becoming the must-have accessory in the chicest films. When Fellini released La Dolce Vita, it wasn't an Italian car being driven by the lead character, but a Triumph TR3A. A British car in an Italian film, for goodness sake. Think how awfully unhappy Fiat must have been about that. Um, it, was, it's, it was so nice to see that British sports cars appeared in films all around the world. Uh, to Catch a Thief. We've all seen the film To Catch a Thief. What was in the film? A Sunbeam Alpine. I mean, we all remember Grace Kelly, but it was a Sunbeam Alpine. Now, that car, the film was set in the south of France. Surely it could have been a French car, but it was a British car. Nice. By the late 50s, sports cars were still a hefty expense. In 1957, the average house price was £2,000. The cheapest of the big brand sports cars was an MGA, and that cost... 840 pounds. But people on a tighter budget also wanted in on some loose driving action. For them, joining the gang meant buying a second-hand car. Or, for the more adventurous, donning a workman's overall and building your own. You could buy a chassis and you could put a fiberglass body on it and a Ford 100E engine. If you couldn't afford the four or five hundred quid, for a second-hand sports car, 800 pounds for a new one, you built your own. That's how much people wanted sports cars then. They were terrible, really. And the results were terrible. And if anyone saw you driving the result, they probably thought you were terrible. So, but what they tapped into was, was the fact that there wasn't really a very small, very economical sports car that you could buy that wasn't one of these plastic horrors. Yet in 1958, a new budget choice would emerge, and suddenly anyone who could afford a car could also afford a sports car. Leonard Lord and Donald Healy had been busy. Their aim was to create a new model that came in at a similar price to an ordinary saloon. But creating the sports car dream at a cut price called for some blue sky thinking. He came up with all kinds of wild ideas. One of his ideas was that the, the back end and the front end would be identical and that only the middle bit would be different. So you, you could just make one section, shove it on the front or shove it on the back. <laughs> Didn't really work in practice. I'm John Bolster, motoring correspondent and ex-racing driver. I'm quite often asked to try out new cars, and this day I'd been invited to Silverstone to see something extra special. What John here had come to see was the Austin Healey frog-eyed Sprite. So cute. This was the sports car that brought the dream to a wider public.
The Sprite got its nickname Frog-Eyed from those front headlights, which made it look somewhat amphibian. It was a real pocket-sized sports car that didn't need assembling in your garage. The Sprite cost £679, a tiny bit more than a Morris Minor, but a whole lot more desirable. If you talk about the democratisation of the sports car in England, um, you have to look at the Austin Healey Frog Eye Sprite. Now, this really brought sports car motoring to the masses like probably no other car. It was, I think, £649. It would do 83 miles an hour. It was a proper innovation on many, many levels. And it was so clever. I mean, you know, the, the front section, he would have the wings and the bonnet all lifting as one piece. So, you know, you didn't have to have complex uh, separate bonnet and then front section. And at the back, to save money, didn't bother to put a boot lid in. So if you had a suitcase, you know, you would have to, you'd have to tuck it in, like, behind the seat underneath the back. But as a two-seater sports car, that's the kind of compromise you'd be happy to make. And in Speedwell Blue, which is a lovely kind of baby blue, it was, a, it was a pretty, pretty little car. And automotive historians always say that the most successful cars are the cars that have these humanoid faces. It quickly got this nickname as the Frog Eye Sprite because of these two headlights sitting on top of the bonnet. Again, it was another brilliant little cost-saving device. Donald Healy had wanted to have flip-up headlights, which obviously involved quite a bit of technology and faffing around under, under the bonnet to make them work. And when the accountants looked at it and just said, that's too expensive, he just thought, well, let's just put them on top of the bonnet like that. You know, at a stroke, creating one of the most distinctive looking cars on the road and, you know, a feature that just everyone loves about it. You look at the front of a frog eyes bright and you see these two wonderful eyes and this little, little grin and you want to give it a saucer of milk. It's just a, a, a beautiful, pretty little car that was cheap, that was accessible. And you look at all the ads, and there is suburban Britain with the girls with their pachong skirts um, and, 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 and the blokes, the Lotharios with their ties and sports jackets with patches on the elbows, loving this little frog eye sprite because it was sweet. And again, it, it gave that hint of sexuality, that hint of speed, that hint of power. But it was accessible, cheap to run, non-threatening, and just a lovely charming, matey little sports car. Healy's stripped-down design had captured the essence of sports car magic and brought with it a whole new generation of drivers eager to join in. Here was a car that didn't cost very much and it worked and uh, what it offered was not that much in the way of performance but a lot of excitement because, you know, the doors are that thin, the steering wheel's here, the windscreen's that big. You know, you really, you feel like you're doing 100 even when you're doing 40 in one of those. So, I had everything. They're tiny little things with 998 cc's, but so much fun. They weighed as much as a packet of cigarettes. The power went to the rear wheels, we had a four-speed gearbox, um, and a steering wheel and three pedals. And um, it, it was fun. You could, you could you kick the rear end out. You could, you could have proper sports car fun in it. They were dreadful. I mean, they were dreadfully unreliable. They rusted to bits. So you had to show them a damp chamois and, 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 and the ferrous oxide would peek through. It also, I remember um, a friend of mine had one and when we drove, when we drove uh, on wet roads, the, the, the water would come through the floor and around the pedals, you know, where the pedals went through the floor, water would gush in, so you'd end up with freezing ankles. But, yeah, it was fun, you know, you, you, in, you know, it was about as much fun as you could have in those days with your trousers on. It was, of course, exactly the sort of car that young men lusted after. I was a single man living in Coventry, actually working at Jaguar when I knew I could never afford an XK150 or an E-Type that I was helping to design. It, but I could afford a Sprite, so I bought one. It's the sort of thing I could go to, to, uh, to events with. It was the sort of thing I could go to, um, hopefully, impress a girlfriend. I mean, she was never going to be impressed by an Austin A35 or a Morris Minor, I can tell you that. But some of them were as impressed as hell by a Sprite. The Sprite was also perfectly timed. The arrival of easier consumer credit meant that it was within reach of younger owners. 
it came about at a time when um, credit was starting to be available. So um, it was, you know, it was one of the new cars of 1958 that would actually be affordable to those who didn't actually have the ready cash. It came along at the right time. It was very much in that sort of Macmillan, you've never had it so good period, you know. And certainly from a point of view of sports car choice, you never had had it so good. Healy had created a car that offered a taste of sports car pleasure. But the little Sprite hit the roads at a time when driving in Britain was changing. The freedom of the open roads was disappearing. And the, the country was doing well and car ownership had gone up by a staggering 250%. Exasperating, isn't it? But you know, it's really no joke, this business of traffic jams. As the roads filled up, the sports car paradise of the early 50s started to fade away. The government unveiled a new project to tackle the traffic problem. It is in keeping with the bold, exciting and scientific age in which we live. In 1959, the ribbon was cut on the first motorway. Jaguar test driver Norman Dewis took a keen interest in this new sports car playground. I went down there when they officially opened it. Well, I think it was Lennox Boyd, I think, who cut the tape and opened it. Of course, we all, all went straight off down. And the strange thing was, uh, halfway down, the police stopped everybody because a woman coming in from London had come up the wrong side and started to come up the wrong way on the motorway. The M1 is a kind of Wild West motoring environment. You've got, you've got this uh, road with no speed restrictions, with no barrier down the middle, just, just a strip of grass. You've, you've got people pulling over to have picnics. You've got, you've got people doing U-turns. It's just, it doesn't bear thinking about. And then you've got somebody in on Austin Healy, you know, down at, down at sort of um, the North Circular thinking, right, let's see what it can do. With no speed limits and long, uninterrupted straights, the motorway was somewhere sports cars could be taken to their limit. Aldous Huxley said speed is the only truly modern sensation. In other words, it's the one we as human beings have, have manufactured. The rest of it is, is, is from nature. Um, and... 1950, you've got this general reaching out for technology, haven't you? We want to, to, to go into space. We've got jet transport, planes, uh, and, and there is a need for speed. So constantly there's this kind of arms race going on. The motorway made it easy to reach top speed, and 100 miles an hour no longer seemed quite so special. To blow your socks off, a sports car needed to go much faster. A new age of speed called for a sports car to match, and Jaguar had just the thing in mind. They would make a car that went faster than everyone else's. Taking a gamble, they closed their racing team and started to focus on making a new two-seater sports car that could do 150 miles an hour. The one, the only, Jaguar E-Type. Oh, that's lovely. This was the sports car that had it all. Designer Malcolm Sayer had made aircraft during the war and Le Mans winning race cars for Jaguar. Now his job was to design a sports car with star quality. Malcolm Sayer, the aerodynamics great man, one of the best uh, designers on, on body shapes, he came up with the idea and it was basically the principle of a single-seater fighter. You have the cockpit, then you have a subframe that bolts on the bulkhead that carries the engine uh, and the prop and all that or whatever. And, uh, and that was basically, he based it on a single-seater aircraft. Norman worked with Sayer to develop the fledgling sports car, taking what the designer had learned from aeroplanes. I worked with him a lot in the wind tunnel and uh, on the test track and that, uh, doing uh, calling and low drag body stuff, you know, trial and error. 
Those days it was all hands on. You didn't have computers doing it for you. More than anything, the Jaguar team wanted a car that could do 150 miles an hour. To sell such a beast to the public meant passing some strict road tests. It was a legislation was brought in that uh, you've got to um, you've got to make sure that the car was safe if the tire burst. That was the legislation. So what do we do? We've got to burst the tire. It was 150 miles an hour. So we, I sat with Dunlops and we talked about it. And they came up with this crazy idea. One of their blokes said, well, Norman, if we get a marksman on the side of the road and we mark the, put a, post, a, a marker up so you know that he's, he's going to fire the shot into the tyre. I said, no way. I said, how if he misses? <laughs> I said, that's the end of me. Not that Norman didn't like a challenge. With the car almost ready, where better to do the final high-speed testing than on the wild frontier land of the new motorway? What I did then, we started to get up at five o'clock early Sunday morning and go, and go down on the M1. And I had a stretch of road from, um, from Northampton to Newport Pagnell. I was to get on there and uh, straight down to Newport Pagnell, over the slip road, back up and do this, get as many runs as I could, you know, by about six o'clock in the morning. And this was going well, every Sunday we was doing this. And then um, I had a phone call from um, the superintendent of police of, of uh, Northampton. And I knew him quite well, actually. And he said, Norman, he said, uh, I understand you're doing tests on the motorway. I said, no, no, no. Jaguar's big moment had arrived. In 1961, the time had come to unveil their E-type creation to the public. Quite suddenly, Geneva Motor Show, March 61, good grief, what's this? The most beautiful car in the world appeared, bang, from Jaguar, the E-type. Of course, the crowds of people around the E-type, they couldn't believe it, the press people were there. This car is, is, is literally a poem in steel, and, and, and still one of the most beautiful cars ever made in the world, full stop, end of sentence, rule off. When Enzo Ferrari uh, first saw the car, he said, what a beautiful car. And he said, we, we've made nothing better than that. And he said, there's only one thing wrong with it, Norman. I said, what's that? He said, it hasn't got a Ferrari badge. <laughs> and it didn't have a Ferrari price tag. Here was a sports car icon which made even the Italians blush from a factory in Coventry. Suddenly, here was a British car that would do 150 miles an hour, a car that looked as if it was straight out of a spaceship, a car that was being sold at an incredible price. As I recall, even with the dreaded purchase tax, an E-Type cost just about £2,000, which was something like half of an Aston Martin price or a quarter of a Ferrari price. It changed everything. A car that you could legitimately say was the nearest you could get to buying a racing car and you're a private a private man living in your lovely lovely 60s 60s house on these 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 new estates in in Hemel Hempstead and it's absolutely heart-stoppingly glorious to look at because the e-type was so beautiful everyone wanted to be associated with it uh, because it was sold at such a reasonable price, an incredible number of people could afford one. And so it meant that if you were the man who had opened a clothing shop in the King's Road, you could probably afford an E-Type. It was just amazingly, as I believe is an expression, it was amazingly accessible. And for that reason, it set all the standards of being beautiful, of being trendy, of being desirable, and all the right people wanted to be seen. In them. They were besieged with orders. Frank Sinatra went to the New York show, saw it and said, I want that car and I want it now. And even Frank couldn't have one. No car before us since had ever come as close to distilling exactly what you want out of a sports car. That thing that, that makes you feel 150% more sexually attractive at the wheel in that car than, than, than without it. And, and legion of the, of the jokes, it was the greatest crumpet catcher known to man. It's as simple as that. There was always that sort of 
phallic symbolism. Um, there were always arguments that, you know, chaps who were maybe a little bit um, deprived in the gentleman's area would need a big sports car with a very long bonnet. And if the bonnet's got a bulge on it, even better. Um, that, quite honestly, is exemplified by the E-type. Um, it was a great big chaps thing. Predictably, men went crazy to get their hands on one. Jaguar had found the perfect way to make a man feel like he measured up against his peers. It might not have been the cheapest, but the E-Type was the fastest, the best looking and most desirable of our mass produced British sports cars. It was a complete revelation in mass production. You look at it and even now and you think this is a hand built bespoke car, but these things were rolling off the production line faster than you can imagine, the pressure on Jaguar to produce them, but they weren't hand-built, they were thrown together. In the nicest possible way, but, but for them to actually offer consumers a car that radiated such specialness, it looked, felt and drove better than a DB4. And that was a car that, that was almost three times the price. It put it next to a Ferrari 250 GT, which was £10,000, um, and it's still look better. This really was a complete production line revelation that they could do it. And everybody would say, how did they do it for the money? And they did it because they cut corners and they, they didn't do the rust proofing and there were bits and bobs which, which were less than brilliant. But in terms of that vision of let's make a sports car that makes you literally wet your trousers for 2,000 quid, that was the impulse which, which made them so successful. When you consider we sold it for just over £2,000, that included tax, I think we undersold it, really. I think we should have charged a bit more for it. With the E-Type leading the way, British sports cars were on top of the world. Britain had redefined the stylish, fun and affordable open-topped two-seater. We could not make sports cars fast enough. Our trousers were on fire. These cars were coming out of Midlands factories literally hundreds and hundreds at a time on Bedford transporters being shipped down to the docks over to, to, to America. The Triumph TR4A lets you know what a real sports car is all about. Triumph Spitfires battled with MG Sprites and Midgets for entry-level wallets. TR4s and Healy 3000s sat parked on the drives of those that weren't short of a few bob. And if the E-Type was just out of reach, there was always the MGB, the biggest selling sports car of them all. Speed and glamour had been democratised. You were defined as a member of this lovely, new, suburban, successful society if you had a nice sports car and if your, your, your wife had a pretty MG midget or an MGB or an Alpine. We had all these social forces, the clear roads, the, the greater disposable income, the, the, the need for change, the, the optimism of the 50s and 60s. This was the era of the sports car. <laughs> 